a lot of people in my churches believe that Catholics are going to hell because they are not properly baptized. The Greek word baptizo means full immersion. I noticed a few verses in the New Testament that I hadn't seen before. Immediately, he and all his household were baptized. Baptism is given even to infants. So Irenaeus' theology is just two steps away from Jesus' teaching. And at the very beginning of Christianity, pouring water was a valid form of baptism. Hey guys, it's Lizzie. Today I'm going to talk about baptism in Catholicism, in the Bible, and in the early church, all of which I believe are the same. Also, I made a part two to this video, just facts about Catholic baptism and what we believe baptism is for. A lot of people attack Catholic baptism and say that babies are innocent and don't need to be forgiven of sin. So in part two of the video, I kind of get into that. I talk about what the church really teaches about what baptism is. I talk about original sin. So if you're interested in that, I'm going to link it up here and below. I want to read a quote real quick about the meaning of baptism to the early Christians. This is by St. John Chrysostom. You see the many benefits of baptism, and some think its heavenly grace consists only in the remission of sins. But we have enumerated ten honors. For this reason, we baptize even infants, though they are not defiled by personal sin, so that there may be given to them holiness, righteousness, adoption, inheritance, brotherhood with Christ, and that they may be Christ's members. So baptism is not only about forgiving sins, it's the initiation rite of becoming Christian, receiving the Holy Spirit, becoming part of the Christian community. So I just came into the Catholic Church two months ago at Easter Vigil Mass, and when I was researching into Catholicism a year ago, the fact that Catholics do infant baptism and sprinkle or pour the water rather than full immersion, that was just a huge block for me becoming Catholic. In fact, the Protestant church I grew up in, Churches of Christ, a lot of people at my churches believe that Catholics are going to hell because they are not properly baptized. We would always say sprinkling isn't baptism or the Greek word baptizo means full immersion. We would often quote scripture of Jesus' baptism in Matthew 3 where he came up out of the water or in Acts 2 when thousands of new believers are baptized after they repent implying that it was adults not infants being baptized or Romans 6 where it describes the movement of baptism being this metaphor of dying with Christ and then resurrecting into the new life. It seemed so obvious to me that in the Bible, Christians are doing full immersion baptism of consenting adults. To me, Catholic baptism just wasn't baptism. So what changed? I noticed a few verses in the New Testament that I hadn't seen before. There's a Bible passage in Acts 16 where Paul and Silas are evangelizing and this woman Lydia wants to become a Christian. Acts 16:15 says, when she and the members of her household were baptized. And then even more blatant, a few verses down. So Paul and Silas had been put in prison and then God caused there to be an earthquake. So all the prisoners are set free. The prison guard is about to kill himself with a sword because he thought all the prisoners had escaped, but they all come to the prison guard and say, no, we are still here. The prison guard was shocked by the ethics of Paul and Silas in not escaping from the prison. And in verse 31, Paul says, believe Believe in the Lord Jesus and you will be saved, you and your household. And then verse 33, immediately he and all his household were baptized. Verse 34, he was filled with joy because he had come to believe in God, he and his whole household. And then in 1 Corinthians 1 16, it says something similar. And so Paul is talking. I also baptized the household of Stephanus. So all of these verses are blatantly saying that entire households are baptized. It seems to imply that even the children in these households are being baptized. It doesn't make a distinction where it says Lydia and her husband or the prison guard and his wife, but the entire household is being baptized. Another thing that I realized is that the Bible only talks about the first generation of Christians. 
So once they grow up and their children are being born into the church, nowhere is that talked about in the Bible. If these first converts into Christianity had children later and they were baptized as infants into the church, it wouldn't be in the Bible because the time period of the Bible is only talking about the first generation of believers. You might think that that's a clever argument for getting out of trying to find a verse talking directly about infant baptism, but I'm serious. If you look at the timeline of when the epistles of Paul are written, when the gospels are written, it's these few decades in the first century. And so the second generation of Christians, the children of the first believers, that's just not in the New Testament. So if we're looking to see how the second and third century church practiced baptism, we'd have to look beyond the Bible. And it's amazing. We have so many primary source documents. We have so many letters and books written by the second and third generation of Christians. And in these church father writings, it is so blatantly obvious that they baptized their infants. And that in the first generation of Christians, that in the first century, pouring water was a valid means of baptism. So the first document I'm going to read is called the Didache, which is also known as the teaching of the apostles. Even though the Didache is not part of the Bible, both Protestant and Catholic scholars believe that this is a valid original document of the early church and that it was written in the mid to late first century. And if you read the first line of the Didache, just like how Paul or Timothy would start one of their epistles saying it was written by them, the beginning of the Didache says it was written by Jesus' apostles. And this is what the Didache says about baptism. Having first said all these things, baptize into the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, in living water. But if you have no living water, baptize into other water. And if you cannot do so in cold water, do so in warm. But if you have neither, pour out water three times upon the head into the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. So at the very beginning of the church in the mid first century when the apostles are still alive, the apostles are writing down teachings of the church. They're writing out theology. And at the very beginning of Christianity, pouring water was a valid form of baptism. They obviously have a preference here for the type of baptism. They want it to be in living water, meaning like in a river, in a moving stream. And they also prefer cold water over hot water. And it seems like they prefer immersion over pouring water, but you can still baptize someone and it can be a valid baptism if you're pouring water and if it's warm water and not in a living body of water. So I'm going to read church father quotes from this book. It's called The Father Knows Best by Jimmy Akin. It just has direct quotes, primary documents of the first, second, third generation of Christians. So if you're interested in what the early Christians actually believed regarding theology and dogma, you should just read this book for yourself. It's super simple and user friendly. So the first quote is by my patron saint, Saint Irenaeus of Lyons. He was born in the year 140, so the last apostle John to die was in about the year 100. So Irenaeus is being born into Christianity a few decades after the last apostle died, and the apostle John, his intern, was named Polycarp, and then Polycarp taught Irenaeus. So Irenaeus' theology is just two steps away from Jesus' teaching. That's why I really trust him regarding theology. So in his Against Heresies, here's a quote about baptism. For Jesus came to save all through himself. All I say who through him are born again to God, infants and children and boys and youths and old men. So he's using a euphemism of baptism, born again, which is what Jesus uses in John 3 when he says that everyone must be born again in order to enter the kingdom of heaven. So Irenaeus is using this phrase born again that obviously means baptism and he says that infants and children and boys and youths are being baptized. Here's another quote from Saint Hippolytus of Rome. He's writing this in his apostolic tradition in the year 215, but he was actually born in the year 170, so he was born in the mid second century. The children shall be baptized first. All the children who can answer for themselves, let them answer. So that's in regard to accepting the Trinity, saying parts of the creed. If there are any children who cannot answer for themselves, so meaning they're babies and they can't talk, let their parents answer for them or someone else from their family. Another church father named Origen, he was born in the year 184, so also in the second century church, and he's writing this in the year 249. In the church, baptism is given for the remission of sins, 
And according to the usage of the church, baptism is given even to infants. Here's an early Christian inscription in the year 250. It's talking about a baby being baptized. Sweet Tyke lived one year, 10 months, and 25 days. He received the grace of baptism on the eighth day before the Calends, the first day of the month. Another church father, St. Cyprian of Carthage, was born in the year 200, and he's writing this in the year 253. But in respect of the case of the infants, which you say ought not to be baptized within the second or third day after their birth, we all thought very differently in our council, for no one agreed with the course you thought should be taken. Rather, we all judge that the mercy and grace of God is not to be refused to anyone born of man. So they were kind of having a debate within the church if they should baptize infants right when they're born or if they should wait until the eighth day. But the point is, it was normal to baptize infants. That's why they were having this argument. There wasn't anyone saying we shouldn't baptize infants. They were just debating if it should be on the eighth day or if it's okay if it's earlier. Here's another quote from Cyprian that's just so obviously arguing for infant baptism. How much ought we to shrink from hindering an infant who being newly born has not sinned except that being born after the flesh according to Adam he has contracted the contagion of the ancient death at its earliest birth. He approaches more easily on this account the reception of the forgiveness of sins that to him are remitted not his own sins, but the sins of another. So Cyprian is saying that in some spiritual way, it's easier for the infant to be baptized. So this is a bit later, St. Gregory of Nazianus. He was born in the year 329, so in the fourth century, and he's writing in the year 381. Have you an infant child? Do not let sin get any opportunity, but let him be sanctified from his childhood. From his very tenderest age, let him be consecrated by the Spirit. So St. Gregory is obviously talking about baptism for infants, and he says it even more blatantly. For it is better that they should be unconsciously sanctified than that they should depart unsealed and uninitiated. So it's not only about forgiving sin. That's not the only purpose of baptism. It's an initiation right into the Christian community and it's being sealed with the Holy Spirit. In the Old Covenant, the Jews would circumcise all the male babies and it was this physical indicator that they were a child of God and part of that community. So it only makes sense that in the early church, the new sign of the covenant, baptism, which leaves an indelible mark on your soul, is also for their children and their babies. Something else I want to say that will help you understand this. So most of you who are watching live in an individualistic culture. I know the US is extremely individualistic. And so in the ancient world, individualism did not exist. Every culture was collectivist. And so in our current world, it makes sense that when I was 13 years old, I decided to be Christian. I decided to become part of the Christian community. But to the ancient world, it really wouldn't make sense to have individual decisions of becoming Christian especially when you're part of a family. We're fooling ourselves if we think that our current cultural perspective is the best way to understand how the first century would have understood scripture. In the ancient world, in a collectivist culture, it would be so bizarre to a Jewish convert into Christianity. So before, they're used to circumcising their babies as a sign of the covenant. And now with the new covenant, they're not allowed to give that to their children. And instead, if their children decide to be baptized at the ambiguous age of 12 to 14, then they'll become part of the Christian community and receive the Holy Spirit. It makes no sense if you're growing up in a Christian family and they're raising you in the church, teaching you theology, teaching you about God. It makes no sense to think of that as an individual decision, especially in a collectivist culture. Make sure to watch part two of the video. I'm going to link it here and below once it is up. It just goes more in depth into the Catholic understanding of what baptism is. I love you guys so much, and I will see you in my next video. Bye!